Yeah, party people, it's your boy Hot King Green, channel live, live and direct, BDP all day, every day. All we do, spark madism. You on Madism TV with the homie Hot King Green and his longtime good friend, Paul Stewart, who's on point, on theme, <laughs> sparking the madism. No <laughs> doubt. What's up, Paul? What's the deal, brother? Man, well, you know, I, I couldn't be our madism. <laughs> And not bring the madism, right? Yeah, the word is by with oh. the cough and the whole nine. Oh, man. That's, <laughs> that's, that's that's the goodness. So what you puffing on right now? Uh, Let me know. Kush. There you go. There you go. OG Kush. So look, this is what we're going to do, right? I'm going to play a quick video. I believe put it in the air right on point with, with the homie Carl Thomas um, off the album. Who want this smoke? Madism. Who want this smoke? We're going to play that right fast. Get some people in the building. Please share, share, share. Let people know what we're doing over here. We're about to have a very interesting conversation with the OG Paul Stewart talking about this West Coast international hip hop. Right. Because he took it international. So we're going to get into all that. And yeah, ride with us. I believe put it in the air. All right. So, you know, my tech savviness is kind of short. So you got to bear with me, bro. There we go. There we go. Mm -mm. Something ain't right. Nope, not that ain't right. Let me back out of here. There we go. Bring that back. Get 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, man. So that was I Believe, Put It in the Air by myself, featuring Carl Thomas, produced by DJ Heron. Big shout out to DJ Heron. Um, it's actually shot it down in Miami at Art Basel, which is the last time I saw you, actually. Right. I seen Nori and DJ Effin in the video, and I, I figured it was Miami. Yeah, that was last time. I think it was at Salam Remy's spot, right? Yeah, we, we, we uh, Salam Remy's pop up shot that he does every year. Um, Right in Wit and Winwood for Art Basel, which is a shame we didn't get to have it this year because of the lockdown. Oh man, um, saying next year though. Oh yeah, you know it's got all that built that built up energy. So you know we here to talk about Paul Stewart. You know is one of the actually you're one of the first folks that we met Channel Live when we when we touched down to LA. Mm. Uh, Malik Levy, who is our A and R uh, L O Seven self, was our marketing guy, and Matt Robinson was the head of Black Music over there. Um, <laughs> They kind of made it, made it happen, and when we touched down on the west side, it was like, "Yo, you got to meet Paul Stewart, P and P pimp." <laughs> you know what's crazy? Matt Robinson gave me my first like DJ gigs that got me off the ground, and gave me kind of my first job was at Delicious Vinyl, but then Matt hired me for his little label, which was short lived through Island. So Matt really kind of put me in the game, and Malik was like my partner in P and P. Like I kind of you could say I put him in the game, but we were you know we were kind of. Partners, you know, he came up with the name PMP mm -hmm. and everything. So me and Malik were like, mm -hmm. you know, we went way back. He was younger than me. I had met him when I was in college and he was in high school. And mm -hmm. then uh, Lano, I met him uh, when he first came out to L.A. Uh, Funk and Klein, R.I.P. Funk and Klein, he used to work for Red Alert. Mm -hmm. Told him, oh, you got to meet this guy Paul in L.A. And so he met me right away and I started hooking him up and stuff, mm -hmm. and, you know, telling him where to go at clubs and stuff. And yeah. you know, we became real cool. So like that was all my my whole little family that you were uh, uh, working yeah. with. Yeah. Well, yeah. Started, yeah. started to branch out and, mm -hmm. you know, and Wait, go but, places. Yeah, so look, like, I don't want to get too far into you. See, I want to start from the very, very beginning mm. because, mm. you know, you have a new uh, documentary out about yourself, uh, a, a white boy from Crenshaw, and, it's, you know, it's your story, and it's a, it's a very interesting story considering when you think of, you know, West Coast hip-hop, you know, you don't think of too many white folks who are prominent, right. you know, early like early early on so i, I kind of want to go back to the early your early days so we can get that vantage point you know right right and also white people that are involved that weren't like culture vultures i mean like you know, right like gary heller and all these yeah. people are very much like later like you know well yeah even, worse, even you know, accused of doing these kind of things but and he but, was before me too in the business well like. also like you know when i say hip-hop I, I don't necessarily mean the rap music business. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So, okay. like, you know, okay. we talk we talk about the culture right. from the ground up. You know, right. your, your particular story from grade school, rebelling against your parents. You know, <laughs> right. like being a DJing, being a part of the culture, then it manifesting into a business move with with, with your different uh, ventures. So, you know, looking at it from there, like, you know. Sure. You know, you're, you know, not to throw you under the bus, but how old are you? 
Oh, I'm 56. I graduated oh, in 1982. Yeah. So no. Um, yeah, my experience was mad unique. You know what I mean? Like you said, I grew up in 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 Crenshaw area, so there were no white people around. So uh, I was in a very nice neighborhood. I was lived next to uh, Deacon Jones, football player. I mm -hmm. lived uh, uh, on a block with a black judge and a, a mm -hmm. black brain surgeon. But we're also right above the jungles. You know, the mm -hmm. infamous. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay's over there, the projects. And so, so, you know, you interact with both sides. So you have kind of a, uh, when you live there, you know, you have kind right, of right. Let's, let's okay. pause for a second. Cause you're yeah. you know, from the East coast, mm -hmm. you know, born and raised in Jersey. Sure. You know, and you know, when you say both sides, right off the people like, right, what do you mean? Both sides. You know, if you're not from there, you say both sides, you know, you, you're from, from Crenshaw, you know, you're not from the hood, but you live right above, People got to know, understand sure, what that sure, is because sure. how you navigate your life right. Right. is very precarious there. You know what I mean? Like Los Angeles is uh, has always been a very segregated city. It's starting to change more now, right? But mm -hmm. LA's black population was in South LA, you know, South Central, South Los Angeles, you know, and Inglewood, and Wides, Compton, which is all South, right? Mm -hmm. So Crenshaw is kind of, you know, and Baldwin Hills where I live is kind of like at the north end of that. So, you know, as you go more east, especially and south, these are where the neighborhoods get like uh, even like poor, let's say, for the most part. It's mm -hmm. kind of a generalization, but, mm -hmm. you know, it gets deeper and deeper into the hood. Let's say that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of near the end of the hood, but we're also there's a neighborhood called the Jungles, which are some projects that we're right next to right above. And these are some very infamous uh, projects that are popping off hardcore when I'm growing up and everything, you know, and so, so you're very much in the community, you know, but I'm saying it's a, it's a, where I live was a very tiny community where like, uh, very successful black people decided they still wanted to live in the community. They would live there, mm -hmm. but it was a small section. And, you know, South central has a lot of kind of nicer looking areas. People mm -hmm. come here and go, this is the hood. Like, you know what I mean? Cause there's houses, yeah. people from there. It's no Cabrini green. It's, you right, know, right, right. Yeah. yeah that, that's the, that's, that's the, when Tuff and I got out there to the West Coast and right. they took us to the, you know, to the hood, and we was like, they got front lawns and backyards. How's this right. the hood? Like, right. <laughs> where we come from, you get if you live in the hood, you no front yard, no backyard. It's right. like it's crazy, but you get to the mentality, and that you know, it's very segregated out there, right? Yeah, I mean, LA is a segregated city. They used to say, uh, like white people used to say, don't go south of Pico or south of Wilshire or something, you know, mm -hmm. way south of there, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, you know, but it was just an amazing experience for me. Uh, uh, you know, I, my brother was was in the rock. He was a white dude like me, you know, and he was turning mm -hmm. me on to that. And then in the neighborhood, I'm hearing, you know, Rick James and and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, just all the funk stuff that was mm -hmm. going on. You know what I mean? And then just when hip hop started, I uh, was, you know, a few years old in New York. I'm starting to hear uh, Rapper's Delight and Herbie Hancock Rocket and mm -hmm. things like that. And my mind's just getting blown, you know, Curtis right. Blow and things like that. So are you DJing at this at this point? Or are you no, in, in 1982? I graduated from Venice High and I moved out. I went to uh, college in Northern California and mm -hmm. I started DJing. So I started DJing in 1982. So mm -hmm. I was playing a mix of music. You know, I was playing mm -hmm. hip hop. We're playing new wave. You know, yeah, uh, Motown. I mean, it was eighty two. Like I don't even think was we calling hip hop hip hop in eighty two. Or was it just there was a there was a brother named Leroy Worthy from San Jose that lived in our dorms, and he had one crate. It was pretty much free hip hop record. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, you know, it was like there was just a couple labels. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was more out in New York. You know what I mean? But like that, you could buy at record stores. Or in, in well, in in eighty two, I guess there was like enjoy. There was like, um, what was uh, Def Jam? Oh, there was a few was records by then. I mean, Rappers Delight came out in 79. That was Sugar Hill. Right. So I'm saying, so there was like label, there were other records from Sugar Hill. Was label. Yeah, yeah, you know, Grand Master Flash and Furious Blow. 5 with Curtis Blow. Well, that was on, I think his, his stuff was on Mercury. Melly Mel. Yeah, it was on Polygram, I think. Poly Polygram? Mer maybe Mercury Polygram. Yeah, yeah Mercury Mercury and, Polygram. And let's, and let's give a big shout out to Curtis Blow, who had heart transplant surgery yesterday. Oh. And it was successful. Oh, he had he had the surgery yeah. one day. He oh. was up, he was up walking the next. So big shout out to Curtis Blow. Big also shout big shout out to uh Biz Markey, who's going through it with diabetes oh, right man. there. Right now, we want to send a big shout out to him because I love it. He DJed a lot of parties, a birthday party for me. After he did the first birthday party for me, 
He uh-huh. said, you get a discount. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. There were a lot of beautiful women there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, he, he, he was the He was the yeah. with my crowd. <laughs> I'm sure he was. The biz, 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 you get the discount. Biz Mark. I love yeah. Biz, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm praying. I'm praying for him to get. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, man. It's you know it's it's rough on the on on the OGs, but yeah. you know you know we we keep we keep it pushing. We keep it pushing. Now you know it's like eighty two. Okay, eighty two, eighty three, two. When I start DJing eighty two, I'm using the term a little loosely. Okay, the first party I ever did, the the guy from the dorms comes over and he goes, "Hey, you're always playing the loud music. Why don't you do the music for the dance?" So I made a pause tape. And then I had a turntable to play one song when I switched the tape, right? That was my first dance. And I did, I play in like Rick James, B-52s. I'm uh-huh. sure like Rapper's Delight. You know, it was like Curtis Blow. You know, it was like all this kind of stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Some Motown, oldies, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, I killed it, though. People loved it. I was like, oh. And then... I, now, my, this is for a mixed crowd or it's mostly black crowd? Yeah, this is a mixed crowd. This is a mixed crowd. Mixed crowd but right. Leroy Worthy from San Jose had that crate of records. So, you know, I had them hip hop records too. He let uh-huh. me borrow those, you know. So what happened soon after that was a little crew formed. It was a, a Mexican guy named Ernie Rodriguez from Cerritos. And he had gotten a settlement and bought some turntables. Mm-hmm. And then there was a cat from uh, Vegas named Little Red. And he was like an affiliate of uh, Uncle Jam's Army. So mm-hmm. we had our little crew. Mm-hmm. So I would like get the gigs. Uh, you know, we all kind of had our roles, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, little Red could spin circles around us, but the pe- but people were also kind of just figuring out his music too. Like okay. we couldn't let him spin all night. He was too it was too much for people. It's too much of what he was like. He was scratching like Egyptian lover records. Uh, okay, okay. So he just, let me see this is 83, 84. Yeah, 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 yeah. 80, Egyptian 83. Lover Records came out in 82. 82. There was a bunch of hip hop already out from New York at that time. Like I think Fat Boys, um, you know, I mean, um, shit like, you know. I mean, I know Af- they say Africa, Africa, Islam, and is, I guess, I've heard from various sources, he's kind of like the major influence from the East Coast in the West Coast early with the hip hop. And that was like what, early 80s, 80, 81, 82? No, um, that was, he came after that, but, but I mean, he came he, after that? He came. Yeah, you're talking about like Water the Bush and those clubs and stuff he did. So, when when, when you did Ice T drop? I don't think Islam came out to LA until like 86, 87, 88 or something like that. Mm. Ice T had some of one of the first records. Yeah. But, but um and 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 Ice got down with Islam, I think, from jump. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if he moved out. He might have. He might have. I mean, this is the thing too, you gotta understand. From 82 to 87, I was in the Bay Area. I wasn't mm. in LA. Mm. So I, I kind of missed, but there, what was going on? When I came back and checked out what was going on, I mean, it was like, there was Club Radio, Chris mm. the Glove, Taylor, you mm. know, um, the whole Lonzo uh, uh, thing in Compton, you know, the guy who has, it started with NWA yeah. and Gray and- well, 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 Club that's Club. Right, Clue was first, right, first. Right, well, right, right, right. So they had Club and Compton, they were early and all that, you know what I mean? Mm. I'm a few years behind uh, all that. I'm a few years after all that. Um, but um, but when I first started DJing in college, I mean, there just wasn't much going on like that. You know, I became aware of Islam later. And, and Islam was like some real New York shit. He had blacked out on all the records and you know, all, like, <laughs> James, all kind of Jane Brown rock breaks and just crazy shit, you know. Uh-huh. Right. I, know I ended up with a couple of his records. You, you know, when you DJ parties, because I was DJ, I was involved with Water the Bush, mm-hmm. and I, 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 which was a, a a seminal LA club, and that was Islam and Ice T were involved, and that was um, that was on like Sunset and Western, and like that's right before like like Mugs, like Cypress Hill wasn't out yet. We had like a showcase for them, you know, mm-hmm. like right around that time at that club, and. Mm-hmm. Things like that, you know. But but everyone everyone played at Water of the Bush. I mean, like um, LL Cool J, Public Enemy, De La Soul, all those groups performed there, you know. Right. Uh-huh. So, yeah. at, at what point do you decide? You know, I really want to get knee deep into the music business and and, uh-huh. and really focus and you know target artists because you know you you kind of like the gateway for a lot of huge acts. Um, you know, everybody from Coolio, Farside, Warren G. Like you know, you've been around a lot of seminal hip hop projects that's like, you know, so when was it that was like, you know what, this is it, 
this is my focus. You know, it took a long time because like you said, I came in it as a fan and just in the love of it. And I was just doing it to be a part of it. And then it was kind of like, oh shit, I can make a living. Mm -hmm. but, like that whole thing was just not even on the agenda for me or like, you know, what I mean? it, it, it seemed alien. There weren't a lot of examples of that. You know what I mean? And so, but, but interestingly enough, when I got like my first internship at Arista, and at that same time, I was doing clubs like Water the Bush and everything like that. That's when I kind of just started getting the butt. Like I was working, man, we worked like 50, 60 hour weeks at Arista for like $100 a week. In wow. Time. And then like at night I'm doing clubs and parties. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really grinding, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I, I fell in love with the idea of, of, of working in music because I had never really been exposed to it. I mean, I've been putting on shows at college and DJing and, mm -hmm. you know, but. You know, I was a 12 inch buyer at record stores, but you know, this was like working for a label. It was like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm really learning the industry. So I fell mm -hmm. in love with it. And uh, that's when I just, but I didn't have like huge aspirations necessarily per se. Then it was just like, I had a few jobs and shit didn't really work out. And people started coming to me and and, and giving me entrepreneurial opportunities because they saw I was a hustler. Mm -hmm. I was like the one in at least, the, LA was, there wasn't a big music industry especially there was no hip hop music industry hardly at all around that time. So mm -hmm. just that I was out in the clubs and around and, and doing at first doing street promotion for labels. Mm -hmm. People saw that I worked for labels and that was, I was the only person that most people knew that mm -hmm. had an affiliation to like labels or real industry shit. Our mm -hmm. scene was real removed. It was like artists mm -hmm. and, and like I'd seen somebody talking about all the A&Rs and people going to New York parties and stuff like that. We didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Well, there was no music industry out here. Like all the labels, hip hop labels, were all out of New York. Wow, you know, like time. the one thing I I could there was ruthless. But this is like a Compton thing. You know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. like you know. Yeah. Well, the one thing I see, like from from the West Coast, just being an outsider looking at the West Coast from outside in, when you see gatherings or parties or it, it seem to be parks, outside gatherings, barbecues. Um, the weather, you know, the weather, but that, that kind of, it's, it's, you know, it's a different environment. It's a different hustle. It's a different, like everything in LA, let me say LA because it's not just LA, but on right. the West coast, everything's far. Mm. Right. So you see all these people coming from long, yeah, you know, we got the community, the hood. Yeah. But it's also seemed like people from far and wide coming in so to be connected in all these different bubbles and you got to get your hustle on for real for real number one number two you have to really solidify your relationships with all these different people who you know aren't always on the same page so that kind of had to add something to your your value from a business standpoint being able to tap into all these different folks well, huh? well, you, well you know early on though it was easy because it was just like us against them or it was just like the people that was into it were all kind of connected because they were connected into the culture mm -hmm. you know what i mean and people even kind of looked out for each other it mm -hmm. wasn't even so much about because there was this love of the of the art mm -hmm. you know that that didn't last forever you know, Trying to get it right, my bad. No, no I, I got, I got this, I got this sitting here for like the last half hour with nothing to put in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. no, but at first it was more about just the love of the culture. So it was easy to connect with people. People connected you with this person, that person. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it was also too kind of limited. Like there might be one person in each city who was like the shit or something. Mm -hmm. Not in the big, big city. Sort of not New York or mm -hmm. LA. San Francisco or something, but you know what I'm saying? Like when you start going into smaller areas and stuff too, uh -huh. like you find that one person, oh, this guy covers that area. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like, uh, speak, that, speaking of, let me just shout yeah. out right fast. Somebody who was that, you know, that guy for us out there, uh, rest in peace, bigger B. Oh, what a great guy, man. Yeah. Bigger B was the guy. Yeah, you know it's crazy. I met him uh, when we were both coming up. I was DJing some sh like shitty underground club in, in Chinatown, and he was the security guard. I remember we smoked a joint and we kept mm -hmm. homies, you know. And then, but I was so proud of him, man. Like the way he just built his shit up and everything. He was such a G about it, and was such a nice guy, you know. And it's funny because like you know he he knew Suge, you know he he had he had played football with Suge or whatever and stuff. Uh -huh. you know? It was like he was a big dude, you know what I mean, everything like that, but. But he was so uh, his demeanor was so uh, different. You know, his he style. was so 
Yeah. But yeah, what a, anyway. Uh, and what a culture. Uh, uh, what a guy who did it for the culture. For I the mean, culture. People that don't know, they went around L.A. at that time. You know, his club, Unity, was the club. Unity. Like, everyone, Wu-Tang. You had to, you had oh, to touch you, down that Unity. You had you to. Hip -hop, you had to perform there. And, you know, see, Bigger and me came up, and, like, before he was doing that, I was doing some of the clubs that you had to fuck mm -hmm. with. You know what I mean? And by the time he started doing Unity, I was off running my label and everything. But it was, mm -hmm. it was so it was so much love. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, some of the groups I had will perform or whatever like that. But mm -hmm. he was just a really solid dude. And, and, and what was amazing was, you know, he was one of these guys who was making a business out of supporting the underground. And it was rough on him, though, yeah, you know, yeah. because he'd do favors for these artists who weren't anything and then they'd blow up and they wouldn't return the favor. And, mm -hmm. you know, so he had to, you know, the, the, the concert, because basically he was booking concerts at the end of the day, mm -hmm. booking yeah. shows with artists. Mm -hmm. And that's a rough business, you know, yeah. and these artists start to blow up and all of a sudden they're with William Morris and they're like, call my William Morris agency. And you're like, I had to show what, you know. But that, and I'm lucky I'm not in that business because, you know, but, uh, I put on a couple of shows. I put on Leaders of the New School, first show ever in LA. What year uh, was this? The club was called Hang 10. Hang 10? I don't know, man. You'd have Maybe to. Maybe not with like 90, 91, 90, Probably 91. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Whenever yeah. it came out, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at that club, we had Daddy Freddy, Jamalski, um, I think one other dope artist I'm trying to think. It was pretty short lived, you know. But um, yeah, you know, I was involved in uh, uh, in in some shows and stuff like that. But I never really got that. That business is rough and grimy. So I respect yeah. anybody that makes a living from the the live concert business. Yeah, I, I've been removed from that. Luckily for me, you know, mm -hmm. I fell into management at first, and that turned into a record label for me. You know, mm -hmm. but so uh, who, who was your first artist to, to manage? When did you switch gears? Decide to become a manager? And who was that artist that? Well, I didn't switch gears. I kept doing it at the same time. You kept doing it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first artist that I managed that I remember that I got to kind of deal for was uh, Vicky Calhoun. She sang background on the Red Hot Chili Peppers. She was a, a singer. And I got her a demo deal with Quincy Jones' label. Damn. Max Roach, the drummer, his son did A&R over there. Raul. Oh, yeah. Raul. I know Raul. Right. Very, very good person. That's my dude. Right. So he Roach. gave her a demo, demo deal. Uh-huh. This guy Amp Fiddler was producing it. I don't know, you know. Um, that so that didn't, you know, that was a demo deal. That's as far as that went. And then uh, I managed House of Pain shortly, and I wow. shot their demo and I got them their deal. But I didn't end up being their manager very long after that. So right. yeah. And then, but shortly after that, I found Farside. Mm. Yeah, one of my favorite groups. Yeah, that went better for me. And, yeah, uh, and then you know after that, Coolio and and oh. the you know, so, so I had to run right around that time. Yeah. Well, well, well they you know this the story is you know how you met these guys. The you far know, from, Well, it's all of them from 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 um you know Cyprus to Coolio to like you know we need that I story. Funny, I got some funny Cyprus. <laughs> that story. Let's yeah, go. Let's go. Okay. So when I moved, when I got my job at Delicious Vinyl, my first apartment was in the grimiest. Uh, a little apartment complex on Sunset and Normandy, actually Kingsley. And if anybody don't know LA, I mean, that is a very seedy part of Hollywood still to this day, I'm sure. But back then was, I mean, you know, crack hoes and, you know, Ooh. drug dealers, and just grimy. But anyway, <laughs> the apartment complex, it was like four stories and it had like three or four units on each floor. Mm -hmm. And there were all these old school New York rappers. Well, the joke was it was half heavy metal dudes and half rappers that lived in there. <laughs> but uh, Grandmaster Kaz and Prince Whipper Whip lived wow. there. Wow. My first roommate was Special K of the Trend mm. 3, which didn't last very long. And Muggs and Aladdin, I moved in with uh, Fabian Duvernay, but Muggs and, or he moved in with me, but Muggs and Aladdin had an apartment where Muggs basically formed Cypress Hill. And in their living room, they had their turntable setups on either side of the room, no furniture. They would wow. just DJ Lad and fucking DJ Mugs in the goddamn same apartment, fucking DJ Aladdin. An hour every early. Yeah. That's crazy. We're mm. like, and Aladdin had just won like the world class battle or whatever. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, here, well, here's the funniest shit. Me and Mugs, man, like we was coming up. Obviously, look where we lived. Mugs was not balling. And we used to piece up on dub sacks. From whip and they were small as fuck. With, with Prince Whip and Whip, yo, that's fucking ill, B. 
You can tell me, like, in, in the early 90s, in the same space, the same complex, DJ Muggs, DJ Aladdin, Grandmaster Cass, Prince Whip a Whip. You know, you got fucking East Coast okay. and West Coast, Special K, Special yeah. fucking K from the Treacherous Three Yard. Like, was actually my roommate for a month or two. When I moved into that building, he was my roommate. And then I moved in with, Faye. I decided I, I didn't mean I was cool and living with Special K. So I moved in with Faye. I got another apartment in Fabian Duvernay, who had been my roommate in college, uh, who worked at Interscope and all that stuff for years, moved in with me. It was grimy over there. Yeah. It was like, you know, like, there would always be like shopping carts left in the like, you know, little outside, little fucked up grass area at the bottom, you know. But Whip's apartment was like two doors down from us. That's fucking amazing, bro. Like, like that's was, shit I would never think. And it was right by it was right by where that club Water the Bush would be later. But I, I think it was it was before that time, if I'm not mistaken. Sometimes I get my dates a little messed up, but you know, uh, I know that um that was my first apartment. So I was working at Delicious Vinyl, you know? So I was doing, and you know what's crazy is Delicious Vinyl took me to New York with Young MC for New Music Seminar, and that was the first time I ever been to New York. And that blew my mind. Wow. Yeah, bro. Like, you, like all this shit you're saying is like historic, because, you know, Young MC, Bust the Move was like the fucking biggest record probably right. that year it dropped, right? right? It was huge. But what was great was, I went to New York and I became cool with all these like hip hop legends. Uh, and they were like, I'm the LA guy. I started writing for The Source. Mm. I got cool with like, you know, people like Bob Beto, mm -hmm. people like Clark Kent. I mean, I just met so many of the whole New York, like, you know, um, the real heads, you know, a lot of the real heads that was, you know, mm -hmm. at all the parties, you know what I mean? So uh, it was great because a lot of people kind of, um, I just formed a lot of relationships with a lot of good people uh, from that era, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you know, you say like the, uh, this would be the early 90s still. And yeah, like 92, 93. Hip hop yeah. is really like just getting its its commercial legs up under itself, you know, be, you know, going from an underground right. sub, I subculture to fucking the shit. I met baby Chris Lighty with the Jungle Brothers. Rest in peace. Oh, all right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. So I'm meeting yeah. all these people, and see mm. that relationship affected my life greatly mm. because later, when I'm working with uh, John Singleton, he's the one that recognizes Warren G, and says and sets up the deal. Me and Chris Lighty EP'd the Warren G album that was on Def Jam. Damn, right. that's a that that's amazing. That's that was their biggest project. To that day, yeah, with the, with the, right, yeah right, right, like right. god damn. Well, you know what's so crazy too is that if you think about it, like that, that, that's that Warren G project, didn't it save Def Jam? That's what Russell Simmons said. You you know, yes. That's what Russell Simmons says. Yeah, it's on that's on like, right. they, 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 yeah. Def Jam was struggling, you know, and yeah. We so use that quote in the white boy from Crenshaw trailer too. Yeah. Mm, yeah, of course. So yeah, you know what? Speaking of the, you know, white boy from Crenshaw. Yeah. You know, we you know we have the trailer. Let me let me cue that back up, and you know we want our viewers to see what you got going on. Yeah, appreciate that. Yeah, man, that's what it's about, bro. Like, your story is an amazing one. You know, it connects both coasts as we see. Mm -hmm. And. Um, You know, it's good to see, you know, the when I say understanding the culture and who is there, who's a part of it, who saw it from the ground up, who is involved because it was for the love and not for mm. a check. Mm. You know, that all that's important for people to know and see. Yeah, no, it, it, it was a very exciting time because, it, like I said, everyone loves stuff so much, you know. But uh, and it was it, it was it was so new, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, here we go. I'm sorry. Let me get this call. Let me open that up. Oops. Right here. Getting better at this. That's what's up. <laughs> Boom. 
destined to have a unique upbringing. My dad decided to buy a house in a black neighborhood at the height of what was called white flight from South L.A. Whites don't buy houses in Compton anymore. Yeah, my dad was crazy as fuck. I love the music I heard growing up. My homies from around the way turned me on to Rick James, Cameo, the Daz Band. See, hip-hop had barely hit out west yet. It was an East Coast thing. In 1982, I heard Rapper's Delight, and needless to say, my mind was blown. And my friends are gonna try to lift your feet. I started DJing when I was 18, and I cut my teeth, grinding. Underground clubs, shitty parties, hustling gigs, promoting. I worked my way up from the bottom. Pretty soon, I formed one of the earliest street promotion companies. See, the money Jazz. we make, the money we promote the records, G. PMP, we are pimping the music industry through street-level promotion. Naughty by Nature, De La Soul, Queen Latifah, Brand Nubians, leaders of the new school. I had an ear to the street, a great ear, man. I could hear a song from a block away and know who was it. I discovered iconic West Coast artists, the far side, helped get Cypress Hill signed to Columbia. I ended up managing House of Pain. Ice Cube brought me on board to do marketing for his label. All of a sudden, this dude with crazy hair is standing in front of my desk telling me I'm going to be his manager. That was cool, yo. Anyway, it was pretty unusual for you know white guy to come in. He's in here. He must be somebody. Let's go outside sit in the car and play it for him. It played through the first verse, and I ejected it. He said, let me take the tape. Warren Z, super producer. That album literally saved Def Jam from going out of business. Without Warren G, we would have had to sell the company. We would have fell apart. I also brought Def Jam their first ever number one pop record. This is how we do it, by Montel Jordan. And for all that, Russell Simmons and Lee Arcon from Def Jam straight up sued me. Some of the worst people I've ever had the displeasure of meeting with powerful entertainment sets. Let's just say I didn't want to go golfing with them. I'd much rather be with some of my friends playing basketball. Growing up in Crenshaw has had an incredible effect on me. I was so blessed and accepted by people, which made me feel like I could always be that way in the larger urban community. John Singleton, the legendary filmmaker, took me under his wing. He made me the music supervisor on his second film, Poetic Justice, and now that's your career, which has included over 50 movies and TV shows, Insecure, Dear White People, Snowfall, Fast and Furious 2, Barbershop Franchise, and Oscar-winning film, Hustle and Flow. It's hard out here. For me, it's a business and a lifestyle. I can hold my head high because I've held to my word. I've held integrity with everyone I've ever worked with, and I've been blessed to work with some of the greatest. This is my story, a white boy from Crenshaw. Paul Stewart. White boy Paul Stewart? Oh, yeah. He's a Oh my god. That <laughs> <laughs> word is fun. Oh, uh, thank you, brother. Uh, you, man. Yeah, man. That's what I'm talking about. You know what? Like you say, like just meeting Chris, I met Chris because I was a fan. The Jungle Brothers were like my favorite rap group. Mm -hmm. so I seen him, I just ran up on him. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we stayed cool. So like you say, it's that part of being in the culture. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like the way I met you, you know, but it, and this is later, like everyone that you worked with was like, you know, crazy, the far side story is crazy because it involves L07. Mm. So um, it was in his hotel room that I met the far side. It was at a convention called the Gavin Convention. Mm -hmm. San Francisco radio, college radio newsletter. Or was I there? Was or, I there? Probably not. What year was this? San Francisco what? Gavin. San Francisco. San Francisco Gavin. Uh, I'm bad with years, man. I'm I'm gonna get I'm getting that together. But ninety four. If it was ninety four, I mean I wouldn't might what near there, but I'm just thinking I was in right. the vicinity, the atmosphere. But it might was maybe before that ninety three, ninety two. Probably, but I don't know, man. But, it, but any right, but anyway, Razkaz was there, mm -hmm. and 
It was before Lana worked at Capitol. So probably. Okay, then now we wasn't there. <laughs> no, no, we wasn't so, there. Razkaz was a dancer. So was the far side. They were all like boogie dancers, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah. And so he brought them up to the room. And he was like, yeah, these guys are a rap group. And Lano, LO7, your man, he said, yo, this guy gets people record deals to me. I had only really gotten House of Pain a record deal, but I guess that's something. You know what I mean? And, it, and it's funny because it, it was more like, yo, he gets people record deals. Like, <laughs> he, got the, he got the bass voice and shit. Oh, my. Come on, man. <laughs> Lana with the bass voice. Do that. You you killed that. Yeah. <laughs> Big shout out to my man. Big shout out. Yeah, this, this guy gets record deals. Right. Big right. model right now, by the way. Oh, I love that. What a fucking... You know, I'm gonna shout him out in every interview, and uh, I love that man. And uh, he said that, and uh, even though he had his own label at mm. the time, and mm. even though there was a guy that worked for Tommy Boy in the room, but he did marketing, mm. and even though, and well, that's it, and and, and uh, Malik Levy was also in the room, wow, and because uh, that was my right hand, yeah. you know, just, just to let people know who wasn't, you know, didn't see ahead of time, Malik Levy. And Lano Seven Self is who we're talking about. Signed Channel Live to Capital right. in '94. Ni right. So he's laying the groundwork for a lot of important stuff right before my own birth to the you know scene, so to speak. So yeah, right. Right. So they come up in the room. Raskas says they rap, and then they. It's kind of a famous story I've been telling, but yeah, I love the stories. So they get in a little huddle, and then they come out and they do your mama. <laughs> and they just on top of bed and shit, like you know, wow. and the walls, you know, right? And and we dying. I mean, you know, it's crazy. You know, your mom's classic like, song, classic hey, fucking you know, song. Two burritos, where you know, it's, uh -huh. it's like one in the morning. I mean, we up in there, you know. Wow, faded, you know, drinking whatever. So got their numbers and everything, and then and then the next day, to Malik's credit, your guy. I was like, the next day or two, I was like, they were that dope, right? We weren't just that faded, right? <laughs> he was like, no, they were dope, for sure. Yeah, yeah I right. So, I thought so. Okay. Yeah, that's, yo, Malik, that's my dude right there. Big shout out to him, especially because, mm -hmm. you know, he heard the, he had the ear to hear what, you know, before mm -hmm. anybody else, we ran around mm -hmm. New York City. We couldn't really get the embrace like we wanted. You know, people was checking, but the labels wasn't checking like we wanted. And right. Amelia Moore, who worked at Atlantic, sent the demo to Malik when he got the job at Capitol. He called mm. us up later. Uh, he flew out. Uh, him and Lano, we met them. They loved the group. You know, me and Tough. K KRS is involved, so it's kind of the nail in the coffin when it comes to that. Right. And then Mac stepped in, and him and Chris had a relationship. Actually, Matt and Chris had a relationship, and Lano, they, they went back some years. So, you know... Again, these are people who are are in the culture before there is a music business, really, before labels are really, these are people who are tilling the soil, getting it right, mm -hmm. playing the right records, you know, breaking the right groups, you know, identify, actually a and ring and building, developing projects was a thing. Right. Well, there was no internet or nothing, so you, you couldn't do it like that. Mm -hmm. No, Chris was, you know, it's crazy because when I worked with Matt, he had this funky reggae. His first club was called Funky Reggae. Mm -hmm. And that's where like Spike Lee met Rosie Perez and everything like that. And mm -hmm. then and then his next club was called Peace Posse. And then he that's how he hired me to DJ. And that's where I started DJing for him there. And then he got a label deal and he did it, but he did a funky reggae album too with Warner Brothers. And I think there was, I think KRS one was on a song. It was like a reggae hip hop compilation, I'm not mistaken, you know. But we idolized uh uh KRS one. I mean, I've been playing his records since his first album. Mm, yeah. That he, first shit came out with that ACDC and everything on there. You yeah. know, I, I grew up listening to a lot of like guitar got a rock. Dopey? Got a dopey. Got a dopey. Yo, the, that I, album cover and everything just like that. I was introduced, I was yeah. introduced to BDP in homeroom class 1987. By KG from Naughty by Nature. Wow. We went, we went to high school together, well, junior high school and high school together. Wow. We graduated the same year. Vinny and Tretch graduated the year behind us. Um, and then, um, yeah, so 
you know, again, the culture before there was, this is Naughty by Nature, before there was a new style, which was wow. the name of Naughty by Nature before. Like I saw, I saw that whole thing form at my, my high school talent show, 1986. Biz used to come through. New edition would come. That must through. have been inspirational for you, huh? Uh, it, it was, man. I, the reason why I started taking rhyming seriously is because mm-hmm. I was da- I was a dancer again, boogie. <laughs> like that's a lot of, for a lot of MCs. Sure. The, gate, the gateway to the to the culture is dancing, or graph, or something. It's never really rhyming. Like right. you do something else. But and Lord Jamar was a DJ. Yeah, right. So. You know, being a dancer, I'm out in Texas, you know, doing my school bit scrap one, two, and we're sitting in the limousine and OPP comes on. Now, mm-hmm. I had heard OPP for the first time over the phone. My boy, mm-hmm. Bubby, who was uh, who is still best friends with uh, Vinny, was in the studio when they had a rough mix of it and he played it for me over the phone, like over the phone with the cord <laughs> attached to the wall. You got to explain to people like there's no cell phones going on. He played it for me. I had to pick up the the rotary <laughs> and he played it like that over the speaker no he didn't send an mp3 no, he didn't send a link to soundcloud none of that you know he had to play it over the phone and it still sounded good you could still tell that uh, shit was hot. man i was like you know kg was just a very talented yeah brother, like visionary like we just knew he was gonna be something special yeah. tretch was always that had that energy always had that energy mm. and finn you know he's just a, a very uh congenial guy he's yeah, just good he, yeah, he's good. the glue and the business mind part mm. excellence, like to do this amazing um so you know you what's know, cool is i got to know those guys from the beginning because i was on retainer for tommy boy doing street promotion in la right so on the, i did opp wow <laughs> now and i met shock kim and, and latifah and all those people at that time because when they came to la uh-huh. I was kind of like, you know, and I wouldn't try to overemphasize what I did or my relationship with them or anything. But, you know, I mean, we took Latifah around to some interviews, some uh-huh. regular stories and stuff. Nadi was kind of like, yeah, we ain't fucking with y'all. We're doing our own thing. But we always had a good rapport <laughs> with them. I, I was, I would be everywhere with, you know, the, so Naughty Boy with 118 motherfuckers. They knew I was hustling for those shit. I think they always knew that. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it was love. Yeah. Uh, well, but hold on, before you go on for a second. Yeah. Because yeah. you know when you say street promotion, street team promotions, mm-hmm. marketing back then, that shit was a whole wave that doesn't really exist in the same form now. Right. And, well, you would do it virally now more. You could reach more people. And, uh-huh. You know what right. I mean? So, but the gangster, like just to you go somewhere, you see everything covered with OPP. Now with OPP, just the blanket marketing everywhere. You know the fines you had to pay for. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't really go overboard on that stuff because of the the fines and stuff. But our street promotion was company was dope, and we were groundbreaking because I'm gonna tell you why. We went to the hood. Mm-hmm. We went to all the swap meets, mm-hmm. Slauson, Gage. I mean, I get Compton. I mean, it's all the swap meets, Mid City. I mean, just so many swap meets that that aren't around anymore. Or stuff, right? But the swap meet, I, I, I don't want to stop. Explain the swap meet. Okay, in DJ, LA, give me, give me the LA, cultural aspect of the swap meet. Okay, in LA, the places where records would sell, and you know, this is in the early years, so I'm talking about late 80s and early 90s, right? Uh-huh. Over LA, there were some independent record stores like Royce's and Fortune and Inglewood and Rage on Manchester for the while, but it was mostly there'd be these swap meets that had, like, you know, uh, bootleg clothing, <laughs> you know, there'd be uh, jewelry stands, you uh-huh. know, you know, shoe stands, uh, bootleg shoes, you know, it, you know, you get your own shirt made with your, 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 your dead homie, your girlfriend's birthday, whatever, you know it's what like I mean? A, it's like a big, it's a big fucking warehouse with all these different booths independently right. owned right so, yeah, yeah so for folks and there'd be record there'd be record booths there'd, there'd be, be record booths right you know uh, vinyl and tapes you know uh, yeah this is probably before cds even but they exist in the cd era too mm. wow. but yeah the swap meets were like 
until until cities burned out, you know, basically, you know, they were there. There's, you know, that was there's still, I mean, Sloss and Swab meets the most famous one. You know, it's still there, it's still a big deal, but it just like me, I don't think they really have they might have a they probably have a music stand in there, but you know, they used to have three or four, and I don't know what they sell, but you know, they probably sell for people who like old school heads, they're still mm -hmm. buying big CDs. Probably, yeah, yeah, they probably yeah. have just enough customers, probably, you know, some mm -hmm. old heads, they probably sell oldie mixes. Right. You know, yeah. they would call the bootleg mixes there too, like you know, mm -hmm. like low rider oldies volume one and dope, yeah. just dope shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so the swap meets were a big deal. So we would go and promote in the hood at the swap meets and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was kind of the territory of the LA street promoters prior to our time. They mm -hmm. were really just and there was a couple legendary guys before me, Scotty Spencer and Doug Young. And they focused more in like Compton, Long Beach, South Central, the Swab Meets and the Hood. And and when I came in, you know, I was more Hollywood based, but I also did hood shit. So mm -hmm. that was kind of what was different about our company, I would say, that I did more. Not that they never came to Hollywood or nothing like that, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. but, but I did a lot of shit in Hollywood. I was involved in the underground clubs. I was like DJing and promoting them and stuff. And so mm -hmm. I was just more involved in that scene than them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And at that time, it was just like hip hop was just starting to become more uh, where more people in different neighborhoods were listening to it and buying it. Mm -hmm. The record stores were everywhere. That's how people buy music still. Yeah. Like, that's a shame that, well, there's a resurgence of wax happening right now, they say, but it'll never be the same. Like, you know, the, the importance of going to the record store, what the record store meant to communities, local mom and pops, you know, and you had the major chains, but like mom and pop record mm -hmm. stores were like, very important. I worked at all record stores forever, so it meant a lot to me. Record stores were like a huge impact on my life. I used to hang out at the record stores, you know, when I was a kid, and then, mm -hmm. you know, then later I worked at the record stores, and you know, and then later when I my first jobs in the record business were all working with the record stores, mm -hmm. marketing to retail. Mm -hmm. so that, that, not in the business; those were my first jobs. So, and then and then when I did the street promotion, a lot of that was about trying to promote to those stores. Yeah. As well as being more like to DJs and going to events and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that, you know. Yeah. As you explain, you know, the, the business side of, it, you know, the, um, the strategic, you know, attack, so to speak, then versus now, um, it's just a... Um, some things changed a lot, but some things haven't changed at all. Well, it, it, for example, tell me, like, what what's some things that's like just totally brand new advantageous and this uh, oh yeah yeah there's a lot of advantageous i mean before there was a monopoly like mm -hmm. you couldn't get your records in the record store like mm -hmm. you couldn't be some independent label and just press up your shit and try to get in the place where people are buying music that mm -hmm. wasn't happening and let even if you if you if you got in so you get in some independent stores maybe if you got a buzz or something for sure but so that wasn't easy and then trying to get the way people heard music was on the radio back then. Mm -hmm. That was the only the main way most of, and you couldn't get on the radio either. You know what I mean? So like there was a whole monopoly on everything. The 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 major labels and the distributors had a big monopoly. It was very hard for the independent labels. Independent labels like things like hip hop helped the independent labels because the major labels weren't fucking with it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So it, it gave them like a whole um era where they could do it and and nobody else uh was even fucking with it you know what i mean but then you know so that gave them a nice little advantage for a little while you know yeah uh -huh. um wait i'm sorry uh, take your time what was the question basically uh, the, the differences in like you know oh, marketing yeah. promotion right. strategic approach then and now advantages right. disadvantages you know, right. like the game is changed. And the reason right. why, right. Let, me, let me tell you why I asked this question. Let me tell yeah. you why I asked this question. A great right? question. It's a great right. question. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of dialogue, you know, old school versus new school. You know, when you look at an artist like a Drake or any of the newer school artists, like who are mm -hmm. successful, right? It's way more money. Woo. Like, it's, it's just, it's a lot more money in the game right now. It's a lot more money in the game right now, and it's a like, lot more competition for for, for younger artists. Like a lot more competition. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed. But if you're able to to pop and get a machine behind you, 
you can kind of really create a monopoly. Like there's a 1996 telecommunications act, right? Basically took away a lot of regulations. A lot of things you couldn't do at radio, like play, play the same artist over mm. a certain amount of times within a certain time frame. You couldn't do that prior to 1996. It's just mad. I, I'll you know, suggest all my listeners, viewers, the 1996 Telecommunications Act, we call it the Bill Clinton Telecommunications Act, but peep that. And, you know, it's the reason why the clear channels and the big, you know, right. big boys Monopolies. are able to monopoly. You could own media uh, pla uh, stations or newspapers, so many in a certain, you know, square miles or certain states or regions or what have you. They but took that away in 96. So you could really, right. so if you're able to, as an artist, pop and get a machine you can really do so much more now than you could yes you know in so many ways there's so many advantages so many, so many advantages right you know? the, 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 there's disadvantages but there's so many advantages i mean i think you know for independent artists i mean it's just like you before people could just be try to be artists and hope they get in the right situation try to be smart about their business now you have to be a marketer or you have to have a whole team of good people around you or something. Mm -hmm. But to just be like an artist, artist and making music and think it's going to pop for you without, you know, is probably unrealistic, you know. But, you know, it's all the tools are out there. People can you can make your own content. You can upload your own content, you know. And, you know, I just I encourage people to just try to find good people around them and network across and, and build a team, a squad, you know what I mean? Because uh, it's hard to do alone. But yeah, the opportunities are are, are, are exciting right now for, for music artists and stuff, I think, you know what I mean? Well, you say your own content. Um, you know, We know about the documentary, White Boy from Crenshaw, but you did yeah. another you did another piece where you, you looked at uh, Dominican Republic. Um, can you talk about that that, 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 that documentary? Yep, straight out of Los Guandulas. Mm. Yeah, View Park Records, um, YouTube. Yeah, um, that was amazing. I um, I went to this, I met these artists that were from this neighborhood in Santo Domingo. It's kind of like one of the most notorious barrios out there called uh, Los Guandulas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was warned by all these people not to go, you know, and all this stuff. Oh, it's super dangerous there, you know. And um, I went down there with my own boy and, you know, met the artists and had no, no problems at all, you know, super. Mm -hmm. So, but um, but it was crazy there. The neighbor was like, it looked like a favela or something, like mm -hmm. you know, like you seen in Brazil or whatever, almost, you know. And mm -hmm. so I was just like, I was just fascinated with their neighborhood, you know. And mm -hmm. and literally, all these people had, everyone I knew before I went knew about it. So I was like, so we met and I listened to their music and stuff, and I was like, you know, look, you guys aren't really known, but everyone knows your neighborhood. I said, let let let's let's do a project called Straight. Let's do a mixtape called Straight Out of Los Guandulas. Mm -hmm. And so they were with it, and we did it, and we shot a little documentary mm -hmm. uh, about their neighborhood. And we, you know, we put the project out, did okay. But uh, what's amazing is, um, you know, about a year down the road, one of the groups, well, the producer just blew up incredibly. He has mm -hmm. huge hits, but one of the groups blew up. They have a song with twenty million views. They toured. Europe, excellent, um, excellent. and you know, and so it's great, you know. So then I went back and I started interviewing, started working with one of those artists uh, from the Blue Up, and um, started documenting more artists. And um, um, so there's like a seven minute mini doc that's on YouTube, uh, straight out of Los Guandulas and um, View Park um, Records. Yeah, yeah I'm actually, I wanted to show it show some of it but i'm having problems uh do you want me to send it to you should i throw it in the chat uh he, but i'm trying i'm having a problem pulling up another um oh it, uh jazz i need you for a second so um having problems pulling up another window now i'm trying to make it a a, a full-length feature doc about just how music can work about these communities mm -hmm. you can't hit that No, I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose him for sure. Oh, 
So yeah, why don't you just tell the viewers right fast the name of that dot that that piece? Straight out of Los Honduras. There you go. You know, I don't even want to butcher it. My my Spanish is not 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 what it should be, and no my wife, and my wife is Dominican, which is horrible. View Park Records. Um, but yeah, so I I I just went back and started filming more artists and just um from other communities similar to this and. Uh, just kind of examining the relationship with these communities and music, you know, mm -hmm. because obviously we know that the stuff always comes from the streets. Like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know what I mean? Comes out like the best artists never come out of like, you know, really like bourgeois areas or, you know what I'm saying? Or, I mean, art comes from struggle typically. Right. So I just think that's one of the reasons that um, the best artists tend to come from uh these type of environments, you know what I mean? And look, good artists can come from anywhere. I'm not, right. I'm not trying to say, oh, you have to be from, you know what I mean? That would be kind of ridiculous, but but you certainly find, especially when it comes to urban music and all, I mean, just starting to find a lot of that talent tends to come out of these kind of environments, you know what I mean? Oh, here we go, hold on. But it was pretty amazing experience to film and be welcome in these Not communities. View part, right? Okay, got you. I want to make sure it's the right one. Mm -hmm. All right, let me come back here. So, so I want you to introduce this clip. It's a, okay. it's, a tra it's the trailer for Straight Out of Los Guandules. Okay, so this is a documentary about music from the Dominican Republic's, like some of their most impoverished barrios and how the relationships with these neighborhoods and the music uh, exist. And uh, yeah, one of these groups and producers is a very popular big deal now. There we go. La necesidad te inspira, cuando tú estás bien también te inspira, o sea que el barrio es todo. Nosotros podemos decir que la música de nosotros es el barrio, nosotros los que vivimos en el barrio lo que es, lo es lo que expresamos en la música, eso es lo de nosotros. Bueno, nosotros somos los chamaquitos del millero, el blonco y el trato. Nosotros los chamaquitos bocanos de este lado, el Feli mm. y yo en el arte en la casa. Vamos a romper con todo, para adelante. O sea, las oportunidades para que los jóvenes puedan llegar vienen de los barrios porque ellos son los que conocen el talento. Pasa algo malo en el barrio, eso te inspira. Si te pasa algo bueno, te inspira. Mayormente lo que se necesita es oportunidad. La creación de trabajo en la República Dominicana. Eh, un mejor cambio, el barrio más bonito. Cuando te digo del barrio, tú puedes ver yo. We are the... Mucha gente que no mata a Juan como, como, como que la mayoría de jóvenes que están ahí no, no superan. Y hoy en día lo ha hecho. Tengo un estudio en un barrio. Habemos mm. muchos jóvenes que tenemos deseo de superarnos y de tirar para adelante. apareció la ayuda económicamente por los talentos son que nosotros nunca nos podemos parar uno nunca se puede parar porque el que se para se atrasa you know what's crazy Wait, can I tell you what's crazy? What's crazy is that video, the group that's talking about where they're going to be in five years and be global and everything, they toured before the pandemic, they had just gone to Europe, to like Spain and Italy and like it was, it, I seen yeah, them, a, them in front of the Eiffel Tower. Yo, it's not like some dope shit to Amazing. see someone have a vision and then be able to manifest their vision it was less than five years ago that that happened for them so yeah man that's beautiful so, yeah yeah 
and and the producer man he's talking about you see i got this nice studio in the hood yo his studio was right in the middle you can kind of see how hoodie it was right you know what i mean like yeah it was right in the middle of that i mean you know he had a big ass door like you know a big fat lock door out of it man, you know but yeah it's crazy mm -hmm. yeah now he had a nice nice little studio there yeah, but he, so, he, he, produced, he produced uh uh Rochi uh Rumba. It's like the biggest song in DR last year, easily. Like, wow, it's huge. crazy. It's crazy. So your, your 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 history of film goes back some time. You know, yeah. you mentioned a couple of the projects. You Justice. Yeah, that's where I started, bro. Like historic piece. You know, rest in peace, Tupac. No doubt, rest in peace, John Singleton. Oh, man, like how do you? Bro, John That's discovered John discovered me. I was working for Ice Cube. I was doing marketing and promotion for Street Knowledge. Mm. You no, know? still, still, you know, I came up doing the retail marketing for the record labels. Mm -hmm. I was doing street promotion. Then he hired me to do that for Street Knowledge. So I was promoting Cam, Yo Yo, the Lynch Mob, mm -hmm. his artists. And uh, I wasn't there that long when I met John. And John was like, I want to hire you to music supervise my movies and run my label. So it's like a dream opportunity, you know? Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And, 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 and when, we, when John hired me to do Poetic Justice, like shortly after, and I started working for him and everything, he wrapped the filming and as like a celebration, he took me and Pac to Freaknik in Atlanta for the week. <laughs> sorry, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. John I'm Singleton sorry. took you and Tupac to Freaknik. Yeah, you got to talk about that. Like, that's a come on, man. Oh, we went to Club One. Come on, come on bro. We went to Club One. We was riding around in a limousine. Uh, and going to parties and 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 freak Nick was just bananas, you know. Right. And, so, uh, uh, so you know, coming up. One thing that's interesting too, too though, was that, uh -huh. and people were definitely like like on Pac or whatever. But he, you gotta understand, this is how crazy people are gonna understand. He wasn't that big as a rapper yet. They were more on him because he had been in the movie. They also, were in the South. Where they're more into their own rap. Yeah, but it's he only had, he only had I get around out. As far as hits, as far as like hits, he had Brenda got a baby before that or whatever. But I'm saying like he hadn't really blown up on, on an international scale as a rapper yet at that time. Wow. Or he, I mean, as like a huge like national most popular rapper or anything, right? Cause all right, so you know my he college. Was, these are like my college years you're talking about right now, right? It's like college right after college for me, right? And this will be this will be before Poetic Justice came out. That would be like ninety two. When you bad with years, right? I don't, don't give me date myself. Uh, any anyway, yeah. So going to the big college events, Freak uh, Freaknik is one of them. Pin right. relays. Uh, you know, you had these big long uh, in in uh, Long Island at Jones Beach, the big fucking right. Like, you know, in terms of East Coast, going to these big e now in terms of those big events, nothing was bigger than freak uh Freaknik, right? And it only went a few years, so yeah. right. Nothing was bigger than that, like right, right. With Jack the Rapper, maybe. I mean, Freaknik was like the biggest for like all people. It, it was like industry was there, but it wasn't as industry driven. It was right. more, it was more about all the colleges and, you know, it was just like, you know, there were just packs of uh, uh, girls, packs of guys, you know, Roman trying to holler, you know, it was yeah. you know, uh -huh. top of cars dancing. I had never been to the, the South. I mean, that was the first time I've ever been to the South. Wow. I'm from LA, bro. I was like, what the fuck? You know? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Everything, I everything, blew, everything blew my mind. You yeah, know? So, yeah. Uh, in the yeah. best, way, I loved it. You know, I got. A, I, I love. I, I've been. I've been knowing Jermaine Dupree and Little John and a lot of people for a long time. In, in Atlanta, I, I like the. I like people out there, man. 
you know, it's a nice, it's nice. Yeah. 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 Very friendly out there mm -hmm. in, in, in ATL. Very welcoming. Yeah. Very, very, you know, it would reminds me of um, the West Coast ATL or the East Coast ATL is, you know, ATL is the East Coast displace. Oakland. Mm. Oakland is very embracing. Like people are very down. Yeah, Oakland. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, you know, they fuck with you. They they really fuck with you heavy. Right. They bring, bring you in their home, feed you. <laughs> like they they, right, they, right, they, right, they, right, they right. take care of you. LA West Coast, period. Like Oakland is you know, it has that whole Black Panther background and uh it's deep. You know what I mean? Like, you know, uh, yeah. Oakland's a special place. I remember when I was in college, like at the liquor stores in Oakland, they would sell like iceberg slim paperbacks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At the liquor store. You know, yeah. they got all the Donald Goins books and everything. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, that culture there is that through, culture is thick it's you know? through and through, bro. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a joke. You know it's, what I mean? It's biblical for them out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, I, I love the Bay Area. It's just a little cold for me, but I love the Bay Area, man. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, so man, this has been a wonderful conversation, Paul. Thank you, man. I appreciate having me on, man. I appreciate the uh, the help on promoting White Boy from Crenshaw. Uh, I'm trying to get as many people to see this as possible. The, uh, the movement is going strong. Yeah, got, got a lot of thumbs up from some big uh, important people. So you know. Yeah, uh, I, I think you know for all my cultural my culture aficionados out there, mm -hmm. this stuff you got to check out because you know, even when you see from the the, the trailer. Like you take it from prior to the music industry. And I think that's so important because you get a feel for what's going on in the street, what's going on in the hood to make hip hop what it really is, as opposed to just the marketing and shit going. On. That's business. Cool. But the culture is the mm -hmm. important part of it, because that's actually what we're selling to people. So we got to make sure it's right and exact, you know, and, you know, a white boy from Crenshaw, I think, does a great job in, you know, showing that that piece of West Coast culture. So salute to well, you. Well, you know, what's crazy is I was, uh, I was sitting at Harun Coffee in Lamert Park, Chase, Chase Infinite, who was like uh, right hand of Big B. That's my, that's my guy, Chase, no doubt. Right, I was sitting at, uh, and he's got he's got your man, Tony uh, Magnetic up in the deck, mm -hmm. you know, helping him with Run Magic. But anyway, big so shout out to Tony Magnetic. Big shout out. So I was at Harun Coffee, and that's where I came up with the name White Boy from Crenshaw. I was sitting there, Drinking a ice smoker, and all of a sudden my brain went doo doo doo, and I said, "When and when the title hit my head, I was like, oh, 'Oh, I'm about to kill him with this. I'm about to just really hurt him with this one.' And I just knew I was onto something, you know. And it's just so appropriate that I was right there. But you know, also I want to shout out uh, my man Marcus Thorrington who made the uh, the sizzle trailer mini doc that we're running around with, and my partner Evan Washington with View Park Records. So uh, these are guys are helping me with a lot of stuff. I definitely want to give them a shout out, you know. But big shout out to her run coffee where I came up with the white boy from Crenshaw name uh, sitting in Crenshaw, uh, you know. And, and I knew I just had a good marketing angle with that. It just seemed like it was good timing for that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. It, got it, 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 so, it, it definitely makes you go, okay. All right, what's this about? All right, well, white boy from Crenshaw. Really? Right. Okay. Show me the way. Right. And, right. You know, so far the execution is a on point, bro. I'm, I'm right. loving, you know, I'm loving what you're doing. But of course, right. I, I respect that less from you, bro. Um, like again, when Malik brought us out, it was like you know, you know that you gotta walk through the Paul Stewart door, P and P, bro. You, you gotta, you, you gotta you tell them stories for the doc, man. I want when you do the full one, you know, what I mean, I'm oh, trying yeah. to, interview, I'm trying to interview everybody, so you know what I mean, like oh, yeah, you, know. you got yeah. it, you got yeah. it, you got it. I, I appreciate wait. you, man. Well, look, yes. man, anything I can do for you, always, you know. And thanks for having me on. Well, yeah, no doubt. I will let you know. We're going to be in contact. Paul yeah. Stewart, a white boy from Crenshaw. That's how we doing it. This is Hakeem Green, Channel Live, live and direct. BDP all day, every motherfucking day. Every all day. we do is spark Madism. This is Madism TV. We signing off. Peace, y'all.